Now, a deal has been struck for the UK to rejoin the European Union's flagship scientific research programme, Horizon. Post-Brexit trading rows meant British-based scientists were missing out on grants for their work from a €95 billion Euro fund. That's around £81 billion. Pounds. Here's Palakush. The first picture of a black hole. Implants that help the paralysed walk again. Mapping the human brain. These are just some of the projects funded by Europe's Horizon programme. The UK should have been part of it after Brexit, but disagreements with the EU meant that Britain was frozen out and falling behind other EU countries. Together, we will transform these ideas into new solutions. But finally, after years of delay, we're back. Well, this is really the best of news. I, I felt a genuine kind of burst of joy when I heard the news was actually confirmed. Uh, and I know that uh, science and research-led organisations, including all of our members, like these are businesses, universities, health charities, they are going to be delighted today and also relieved. This is troubling you? Constantino Pizzalis is among the researchers celebrating the news. Did they hurt? Not too bad? Until too now, bad. his project to find better medicines for rheumatoid arthritis has suffered because of the uncertainty. We find it more difficult to attract researchers from Europe. I was an international lab, we have 15 nationalities in our lab and really thrive the, uh, the collaborative ethos of this research. The uncertainty has had a negative effect on UK research. So what's been the impact of the delay? Well, since Brexit, 337 of the country's best scientists were given Europe's top grants, but they weren't able to take them up, so 41 of them left the country. The Treasury allocated £1.6 billion pound for Horizon. It was supposed to be spent on science, but the Treasury took the money back. And in 2019, when we were still part of the programme, the EU gave scientists £820 million. Pounds. This year, it was just £19 million. The government has made up a large portion of that, but experts say that we're still tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds short. But this is in the context of a huge, multi-billion pound increase in research spending by the government. And now that Horizon has finally been sorted out, it's hoped that researchers, such as Professor Pizzalis, can continue with their science full steam ahead. Palab Ghosh, BBC News. Well, let's stay with this. Let's talk now to Dr Paul Bates. He is the CEO of the UK Space Agency. I'm delighted uh, to have you here on the programme. Paul, so uh, your basic reaction to this news about the UK rejoining? Uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for having me. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Delighted that we've rejoined Horizon and that we've rejoined the Copernicus programme. That's the programme for um, Earth observation from space. I'm delighted because it means that for UK scientists, for UK industry, for companies up and down the country, and for all of us who have a vested interest in understanding better what is really happening with the climate emergency and when there are disasters around the world, being able to act quickly, being part of this gold standard uh, programme of Copernicus, and it is the best programme in the world, means that we've come at the forefront again of uh, the work that brings the benefits of space back down here to life on Earth. Tell me more then uh, about the benefits of being involved in this wider umbrella body then. So most globally leading science is done internationally. I'm um, taking Copernicus as an example, but it's, it's not the only one that the, uh, the UK is involved in. in Copernicus, we're talking about seven sets of satellites that are flying overhead every day. They're uh, taking images that we see on our screens of, uh, of floods, of uh, the, the canopy of, uh, of the forests, really understanding what, the, uh, what is happening in our climate. So if we hadn't rejoined, then we wouldn't have been in a position to bid for the contracts that are coming up for the next generation of these missions. So take one example. There's um, At the moment, it's very hard to uh, establish just how much carbon dioxide is coming from humans versus uh, from other sources. We have the climate change models, which give us a, a decent view, but we really need that experimental data. One of the Copernicus 
programme, one of the missions, is doing exactly that. And the UK is very well placed to participate strongly in that mission. And of course, we have been out of it here in the UK for the last three years. Now, during that delay, we've seen uh, a drop in UK scientists working on European projects. We've also seen at the same time EU nationals working in the UK, sometimes returning with their research work to their home country. Has there been damage by being out of this system for three years? And is that damage uh, going to be residual, going to last a while? while before it fades? Well, we always wanted to be part of this programme, um, and it's it's a real shame that it has taken so long, but that's the, the consequences of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the position with the European Commission until now. So damage has been done to some extent, but we also realised that if we weren't part of Copernicus, it was important to put money into other Earth observation program. So the UK put £400 million pounds of, um, of investment uh, into European space agency programmes and programmes within the UK itself just back in last November. So we mitigated a lot of the problems that would otherwise have been there. But there's no doubt about it. Being part of Copernicus is about being at the, the table for the future decisions and being able to give access to our academics to the very best data in the most timely way uh, and for our industry to compete for those all-important contracts. Just briefly, in terms of the damage over the last three years, just tell me a little more about what that actually amounted to. What, what was the, the most damaging aspect? Was it simply uh, UK scientists no longer being seen as sitting there amongst the decision makers? Well, I think the challenge when, we, when you don't know if you're going to be part of, the, uh, of a programme like Copernicus is the uncertainty that it does. We've always had access to the data, so we've been able to do that good science. Um, but for our industry, and we'd already invested hundreds of millions of pounds in the Copernicus program in the past, over the last decade, uh, our industry needed to know, are we going to be able to um, continue all the work, develop the, um, the next generation, build on the technologies we were at our home to in the UK? And it's that certainty that we now have, so we can continue to be world leading. Paul, a final thought. We've got about 45 seconds left. In terms of going forward then, uh, in terms of these big grants that potentially are available, what do you hope the UK could be pitching for briefly? Well, there is this new generation, next generation of, uh, we call them the Sentinel missions, these satellites uh, that, uh, that are orbiting overhead. Um, I expect our industry to be pitching for those, building on the work they've already done. For example... Yeah. Uh, Airbus in the UK, but we also provide batteries, we provide sensors, yep. and we provide so many data services too. Paul, thanks for being so brief. Great to talk to you here on BBC News. Thanks for your time.